the the evolution of the Jordan Davis. This the evolution. It, it, it's it's better than it was. We've come we've come a long way, everyone. <laughs> we've come and... full circle and really yeah. drawn Jordan Davis. Somewhat full circle. Somewhat full circle. He's still not DT one though. Welcome to another episode of Boom or Bust, the draft show. Max Chalik alongside Nick Miriam and Donnie Clemens. So we've done every offensive position for our top 10 positional rankings. Now moving on to the defensive side of the ball, which is by far, I think, the better side of the yes, ball in this draft. very, very much. Which is really funny because after last year's draft in 2021, that, was, that actually set the record for the latest that the first defensive player was taken when J.C. Horn went eighth overall. The top seven picks were offensive players. And, you know, people are like, oh, is this a trend now? Like, are we going to start getting away from defense? We look at this draft now. Like, I just tell these guys, my top six players are all defensive players. So it is like a wave in the NFL draft. There is no, like, trends like that, at least. Uh, but let's start off with our top ten defensive tackles in this draft, which is a very, very interesting defensive tackle class. And we've been hyping up our Jordan Davis discourse forever. It's coming. We promise it's coming. We've evolved. I will not a be talking bit. about him, unfortunately. Unfortunately, no, I, mean, I will not be. You could no, you could throw your we'll throw our thoughts in. We'll all throw our thoughts in, but Nick will be reading that one. Uh, but before we start the video, please like and subscribe to the channel. Turn on notifications. Be sure to follow our Twitter, Instagram, TikTok at Boom or Bus Draft. Uh, on YouTube, anywhere you get your podcast, so leave a five-star review on Google, Apple, Spotify, wherever, and check out the merch store. Follow all of us, too, at Chad and Score Maxwick, at Pick and Spread for Donnie, and at Nicholas Sports for Nick. Check out Nick's Commander's Podcast to give me two years, and I'll name it just around episode two. Just as good as episode one, which is, uh, he's killing it right now. I'm, I'm a big fan of that podcast. So check it out if you're a Commander's fan, or if you're just a fan of any NFL team and want to laugh at the Commander, because it is a... It's not fun right now, but Nick's, Nick's making the most out of it. <laughs> it's never fun. They make the it, most. It's content. It's content. You never it's want them to be good. The content. <laughs> it is honestly like you're a content machine now because, you know, if you're a, say, Packers fan, you're like, oh, still good. We're still doing good. And it's like, you know, it's not fun, man. It's boring. Like, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> yeah. Boring. PJ never wants the Jets to be good. That's my that's my theory. He never wants the Jets to be good. His, his content's all about well, them. He, ha- he literally has a falling on Twitter because the Jets are bad. Dude, every one of his sports teams are terrible. And he works for the Lions now, and it's like he never yeah, wants to he just, he can't He's where he thrives. Like, they knew. Yes. Like, the Lions knew. Like, <laughs> he, he thrives in being depressed. That's where he thrives. He, he never – I'm convinced he never wants a championship in his life because that he won't know to do we won't know what to do with it he won't know um, what to yeah that would that will be actually fantastic content if it ever does happen i, I will be like taking a plane straight to wherever pj is yep. one of his teams ever like a anything. dog a dog chasing a bone he don't doesn't know what to do when he gets it you know it's like well, i don't know what he's gonna be doing uh but i'm proud to announce the new presenting sponsor of boomer buzzer draft show is WinView, the best thing to happen to sports since fantasy and unlike pj clark you can win a lot with Winview, I have been down bad. Fantastic. I am down bad. I'm not gonna lie, guys. I play some online blackjack, and I didn't realize online blackjack is way more rigged than it is in the casinos. And so I was making every single right move and whatever, and I was losing money. Well, I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta make some money back, which is never a good sign. Which is never a good sign. You're like, I gotta dig myself out of the hole because you just keep <laughs> digging yourself deeper. But with Winview, it is actually pretty easy to make some money, and you know, it's really the best thing to happen in sports is fantasy. It's a new way to bet on sports. It's so much fun. Gone are the days where all you can bet on spreads, over-unders, money lines, or player props. Now with WinView, you can bet on singular events live during games. Like, will the Cowboys score a touchdown? Will this, be, will this at-bat be a strikeout? Will UNC make this free throw? Like, it is that awesome. And especially with the Final Four happening this weekend, you want to get WinView. Because it is really a really, really cool app and a really cool way to bet on sports. You can make bets like these and more on the WinView app. Play for free, for fun. Or if you're like me and you're down bad and you need to start making some cash, enter cash prize contests against other users. All you have to do is answer props before and during the game. And it's so easy. And all you have to do to sign up is click the link that is in our description. If you're listening to this on Apple, Google, Spotify, or on YouTube, it's in our subscription. Or it's in our pinned comment on YouTube, too. So become part of the new way to bet on sports today. So let's start off our top 10 defensive tackle prospects in this draft. And that number 10 is a guy that's, it's interesting where we have him right now. We have him as a defensive tackle, but he actually played a lot of edge at Florida, and that is Zachary Carter. The, yeah, the three technique he kind of played at, at Florida. He's about 280 pounds. 
Uh, he came in the combine, yeah, six foot four, two hundred eighty-two pounds. So right in the middle of edge D tackle, and it's kind of a tweener right now. I think he has to play three technique in the NFL. Um, he got better this year. He's never been a great player at Florida, but he got a lot better this year. He's got a really, really good strength. I think his hand usage is, is decent, um, but he's you know, he doesn't have a great bend, which is why I think he's more of an inside player at the NFL. Not the most explosive athlete either. Um, you know, his feet weren't that great. So I, that was on tape, but you go to the combine, and he had tested out as an 85th percentile at the combine, which is very impressive. Ran a sub five second 40, which is really good. Uh, had a seven two eight three cone four two shuttle, also really really good nine foot two inch broad jump. Like he tested out a lot better and, and raised his stock on my board a lot from what he did at the combine. So he's got the body I think in the NFL. You're gonna want to play him only as a three four defensive end in my opinion. But I, I like his tape a little bit and I think his hand placement can improve. But he's a little bit of a tweener right now. You know you can play him on the edge, play him in the interior. I don't know if he'll really like, excel at anything, but I do like his tape enough to take a fly on this guy early day three or maybe late day two. Yeah, I, I thought his best tape was unfortunately at edge. So that that's a tough yeah. one for him. I think yeah. he does have to play in the middle at the, at the next level. So that, we'll see how that goes. But I'm not super high on Zach Carter. Uh, moving along now, our number nine defensive tackle on this board is really a guy that I've listed as a nose tackle. It's Neil Farrell Jr. from LSU, kind of following up on Tyler Shelvin. is another one of these gigantic run-stuffing LSU interior guys. Um, for my money, Farrell is better than Shelvin. Uh, both, uh, you know, not superior athletes by any stretch. Both are just high-floor run-stuffers, in my opinion. That's what you're looking at here. And in mid-rounds, those guys are generally worth it. And it's, it's something that a lot of teams look for. And, and they generally hit on when they do you know, use their picks wisely at this point and at that point in the draft to find a guy that can literally just shut down the run game for you. Uh, there's a little more to him, though, I think. I, I think he is the type of guy that, although he's not an athlete, um, he has really good burst off his get off because he can stay low. He plays incredibly low for his size, uh, which is something that I noticed immediately. Um, beyond that, though, he I, I knew on tape, like, I, you know, he tested 14th percentile. It didn't shock me at all. I had it written down that I didn't think he was going to be a great athlete. There's a play where he gets to a point where he needs to bend to get to a quarterback. And, you know, he has some burst and acceleration upfield, so he needs to stop and bend effectively. And he just can't stop and change direction. He just isn't capable of doing it because he's just he's quite frankly, he's a big dude um, and it's not really his game. He's not a quickness type guy. He is a, you know, mauling, aggressive power type pass rusher who is going to use his hands, his leverage and his flexibility, which I think is the biggest thing for him is he's an extremely flexible player um, in a phone booth. He can contort around the offensive lineman to kind of gain leverage. And it's, it's a weird thing because you'll see him, you know, start out one way and contort his upper body to get around a yard so that he can push them the other. It's it's a weird play style, but for some reason it works, and it especially works against the run in the run game where you really don't need to get a whole lot of a push. You just need to be able to eat space. And with his size, he does that well enough that I do have this guy listed for me as a late fourth-round pick, kind of like I have with Tyler Shelvin, as a guy that I think you bring in, and he can really give you a boost um, defensively in the run game and potentially have some upside when he does push the pocket against the passing game as well. All right, our number eight defensive tackle prospect in this draft is guy that I was very high on coming into the year. I was too, so don't don't get mad about it. I had this guy. I had this guy is DT two. Yeah, yeah. He, it, it was yeah. a weird. It was a weird time back then. It really was a weird time this summer. Um, Haskell Garrett is who we're talking about, the Ohio State defensive tackle, who I believe is a redshirt senior. Yeah, he's a redshirt senior, but I believe he's like even a year older than a redshirt senior. Like I thought, I thought I read somewhere he's like a 25 years old already, and I was like, oh boy, I don't know about that. Goes to the combine, tests out as like a 45th percentile athlete. I was like, oh, I don't know about that either. Um, uh, his tape though, he showed Ohio State was impressive, especially as a pass rusher. I thought he was a really good pass rusher at Ohio State. Again, not the most explosive athlete overall, but I think his hand usage is really good. Um, he has decent bend, I thought, for the position at Ohio State, too. Uh, as a run defender, he's okay. You know, he's not the best run defender. He's not a guy who's going to eat up blocks a lot at the next level. He's kind of undersized a little bit at 300 pounds and uh, and six foot uh, two. But as a pass rusher, like I said, he's got advanced moves, and that might be because he's been in college for five years. But he has been playing well at Ohio State for multiple, multiple years now. 
And I think you're getting a guy who's day one ready in the NFL. I don't think you're getting a guy who is quite going to be a perennial all pro type player. I think he'll just be an okay defensive tackle that you can have in your rotation. Will he ever be a starter in the NFL? I don't quite know that, but I think he will be a guy that you can have, you know, be your number three defensive tackle or number four defensive tackle and, and rotate in. And he could be like a good situational pass rusher for some teams. So I like Haskell Garrett. I don't like him as much as I liked him in the preseason. Um, he's not a great athlete. He's not the biggest, um, but he, I think he is a pretty good pass rusher. And he's day one ready, I think, as a pass rusher right now, which is valuable. And I think he could be a, a third or fourth, fifth round pick because of that. Uh, yeah, back to the that comment real quick. Yeah, Summer was very interesting. Interesting. Spencer Outlet was QB1, and now he's in South Carolina. So who would have saw that coming? And also yeah. Sam Howell was consensus QB2 right behind him, and now he's by he's a QB1. Pair. <laughs> <laughs> Max pushing his luck a little bit, but that's okay. Um, but no, yeah, was right. def- you, you, you got Malik Willis QB1 right. He is going to be QB1 in the draft. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure I, of that. I, dude, I got so much hate, and I, you saw that video I posted whenever I said back in July – um, whenever I said Malik over Rattler, and I got so much hate, and I was like, yeah, I understand if you disagree. It's not like I'm going to like be mad if you disagree. Like, yeah, it's a hot take. I get it. It's also but summer. It's, I mean, it's not like... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the like, summer. Like, I don't really care about the summer takes. I mean... Yeah. Yeah, well, people got mad. Also, people... People really believe, like, oh, Kayvon's so much better than Stanley back then, and I was like, oh, man. But anyway, um, moving yeah, on to the next suck. guy. Yeah, now they're both going to fall. <laughs> yeah, now they're both going to fall. Uh, this And Trayvon Walker will be a top three pick, unfortunately. So. Trayvon Walker going to go with four of them and Kyle Hamilton at this rate, oh it looks like. God. <laughs> Kyle might fall out of the top ten right now. And Tyler oh. Winterbaum might fall out of the first round. Yep. I saw that, God, too. What are we, what are we I, doing, we man? Give these what are we and, doing? And GMs, like, one draft of defensive players, and they forget how to do football. Dude, it's just like. This is the one draft where, like, you don't have many superstars, and like the few that we have, we're like, nah, we're finding this wrong. There was like Kayvon Thibodeau, Derek. Yeah, Sweeney. do we have to nitpick the very few guys we had? Like, well, it's tough. It's tough. What I'm are we doing? Aiden it's, I'm it's, it's, Aiden it's, Hutchinson's still up there. Yeah, it's honestly, yeah, you're not wrong, especially after that Georgia game, but because apparently he just got like, I mean, we know what actually happened. <laughs> yeah. The public. The public does not. Okay, we need to get back on topic. So at number seven on our list, we have Fedarian Mathis, the defensive tackle from Alabama. So whenever I was watching Christian Baltimore last year uh, during the 2020 or 2021 uh, draft process, my bad, this guy kept on leaping off my screen. And I was like, who is this guy? Because I really did like Christian Baltimore as a prospect. I thought he was a later first round guy. Obviously, Max was in love with him. He had like a top <laughs> 15, top 10 grade on him. And then me, yep, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like me, like I liked him, but I wasn't like in love with him. But then Mathis kept on leaping off, and I was like, why isn't this guy getting any respect for next year? Because I ended up looking him up, and I realized he wasn't eligible for last year, so he was eligible for the next year. And I was like, why isn't anybody talking about this guy? Because we were, we were talking about last year's de- defensive tackle prospects. We were talking about DeMarvin Leal. We were talking about Has- uh, Haskell Garrett. We weren't really talking about this guy. So what's he good at? Well, first off, I think he has good technique at the defensive tackle position. I think he knows how to get around defense, oh, not defensive tackles. <clears throat> I think he knows how to get around the guards. I think he knows how to get around the center. I think he knows how to use his hands decently. Maybe not when it comes to in terms of using his hands like power-wise, but when it comes to hand placement and being able to have creative pass rush moves, I think he is very solid at that. Like I said, has good quickness at that position as well. Also, very good run defender. He may mm-hmm. not be like a top tier athlete, which keeps him lower on this list. He's not a Jordan Davis, a Travis Jones, or Devontae Wyatt when it comes to athleticism, because all those guys tested in the 90 plus percentile. And I couldn't find exactly where this guy tested. I tried to look. He it up didn't. No, started. he didn't actually. Oh, he didn't start. Okay, well, then that's why I couldn't find it. Um, yeah. Because he didn't, he didn't test. But whenever he's on tape, like he's a decent athlete. Like I would assume, any like maybe around the '60s, somewhere mm-hmm. in there, maybe the '50s, somewhere around there. But um, I do like Fredarius Mathis a lot. I do think. I mean, I might be the high man on him. I think I have him as my DT six or my DT five. One of the, I think it's DT six. I have him as my DT six. I'm in love with him. I really, really do like him. And I think he's a guy who you can grab later in the third round. And I think he won't ever be a superstar for you. But this is a guy who could possibly be a rotational guy or maybe even become a starter down the line. But he's never going to be a superstar. But he does have a very high floor considering that I think his technique is good, he's a good run defender, and he has good moves. The problem is he lacks power, and he lacks athleticism, and you can't teach athleticism as 
most people know. Yeah, so I misspoke. He actually did test out of the combine a little bit, but not enough to get a score. So all he did was okay. the, vert- the vertical, the shuttle, which both were actually very bad, and then his broad jump was like decent. But that, those are the only three drills he did was the vertical, broad jump, and, and shuttle. That was it. Okay. okay. Not enough to get a score, apparently. Yeah. Um, so next time we're going to talk about number six on our, our interior board here is Perion Winfrey, who really popped the senior bowl. I think some of us had him relatively high early in the year. I had him. I had a first round grade to start the year on this guy because I, you know, a lot of that was projection. Um, and I think last year's tape, quite frankly, was kind of similar to this year's tape. I saw a guy that had a lot of potential um, and never really put it all together. But then when he does as well as he does at the Senior Bowl, um, and he runs a sub 4940 time, you kind of rise this guy back up the board a little bit. And he did finish the season kind of strong with Oklahoma. Perry and Winfrey, um, to me, uh, if we throw out testing feels to me this year like the Patrick Jones of interior defensive linemen. Like, it's just not quite there. Um, we don't have the production. Like, there's a glaring issue here in that his production is not good enough. And in Patrick Jones's case, the glaring issue was his athleticism testing was not good enough. But I don't know. There's something about this guy's tape where just his get-off is amazing. He lacks power. He completely lacks power. Uh, but he is just high motor. Like, I don't – this is a guy that is – just a spark plug when he's pass rushing and and he doesn't win with power at all he does it with his arms with his with his speed with his bend um from the interior position it's like an edge rusher playing on the interior kind of um and he's a guy that will take kind of the long route to the quarterback if he needs to and has the athleticism to do so if he wants to um my issues with him on tape is that i think quite frankly like every snap he lines up and he's like I'm going to try hard on this play or I'm not going to try hard on this play. Cause there are some, there's a lot of plays on the, on tape where he just, you know, he stands straight up and he just gets kind of pushed backwards a lot and there's nothing going on there. And then there are some plays where it's just like, Holy crap. Like that could, that could be like a dominant interior player at the next level. Um, I don't really know how to label it for now. I have him as like a high third round guy. I think you, you definitely would love to bet on that, that upside in the second round. Uh, because if you do, if he does show those, reps that he shows like every other play in my opinion consistently like he's a dominant player at the nfl level even if he doesn't have power the ability he has get off wise it's some of the best get off i've seen from the interior position period like it's him and like christian barmore and in terms of just all the other things i think he's developed this game you know hand fighting you know uh, you you know bending speed quickness lateral quickness is very good um he's he's savvy on the interior he's just like a savvy pass rusher um, and I don't think I don't think he's a developed pass rush toolbox guy, but he just kind of has, you know, you made it work with the athleticism he has um, very like. I don't know what the opposite of clean as a prospect is like, I'm not going to say dirty because that's like not <laughs> like nice, but like he's like a he, you know, he needs he needs some polishing, you know, he's not he's not ready to start day one. He's the type of guy that I think year two, after he gets drafted, we really find out who he is, and he could really pop year two for whichever team drafts him. 1,000%. Um, okay, so let's go back. I'm My whole theme of this episode is going to be guys that we thought were great and they did <laughs> not end up playing well because our number five defensive tackle, um, which is shocking because if you told me this guy was number five, I would say, yeah, number five prospect. No, number five <laughs> defensive tackle. DeMarvin Leal, the Texas A&M player, who actually, I, I am holding tight. I am I have this DT3 right now uh, in this class, but I will admit, last year, or this season, I should say, was not very good. And it was a significant step back from what we saw from his sophomore year. Uh, he's a true junior, and he just, he, he it really showed more this year, whereas like last year, I was like, so this guy's 290 pounds, like, he could play edge. He could play D tackle whenever. And that wasn't really a weakness for me because I was like, oh, he's just a versatile player. And I love that. This year, when he took a major step back, I was saying to myself, you know, he's kind of a tweener. Like now it's at the point where it's not being versatile. It's more like, I don't know where you can play, dude. Like you need to almost commit to one or the other, in my opinion. And he is still versatile enough where he can play him all up and down the defensive line because he's, he's a pretty good athlete. You know, he tested out the combine. A little worse than I, I actually – would have hoped for him, but still a, a 74th percentile athlete, which is pretty good. I like him as a pass rusher. Um, he, he showed some a lot as a pass rusher, especially his sophomore year is what had him as a top five prospect. If you remember, we actually did a preseason scouting report video on DeMarvin Leal because he was this top flight prospect. And now he's 
not going to be in the first round anymore. Like he might be a, a second or third round pick now just because he took a major step back. And honestly, he was as good as he was as a true freshman. Honestly, that's how much of a step back that he took this year. Um, he's not a very good run defender at all. Like he, if double teams, because he's a tweener, he's 290 pounds, double teams kill him. Like they move him off the line so, so easily. Um, but again, he's, he's a really, really good get off. He can move really well. He's got a lot of pass rush moves in his disposal. I just, it, it's tough that he didn't really improve that much this year. I don't think his motor is really good. Like there are some plays where he doesn't look like he's trying at all. Um, but I still like enough in Liao's tape, especially in 2020, to take this guy in the second round um, just because those tools that he have are, like, top 10 potential. But, like, the what he's shown us this past year especially is, like, day three pick. Like, that is, that's the, the issue that you have with Marvin Liao. So, has a high ceiling, but it's just, like, dude, it's just it, it hasn't been put together. And, and taking a huge step back, is is worrisome like if this guy if you switch 2020 and 2021 i still think he's a top 10 pick in the draft just the issue of he was amazing last year and then he took a huge step back this year it's like what happened dude and i don't know he's kind of on the downward swing right now which is not where you want to be as an nfl draft prospect so he's going to fall to the second third round but i would still take this guy early on day two and i still think there's enough on tape to take on day two and I mean, another thing he didn't mention, like he didn't test horribly at the combine, but it's just he was so clearly outclassed by the four guys ahead of him at the combine, in my opinion, like yeah. so clearly, in my opinion. And the combine really did it for me. Like I had DeBar and Liao as DT3 before the combine. And then that combine just it killed it. Like it, I, it, it didn't it obviously didn't kill him as like an actual draft prospect. Like he's still going to be a probably day two pick. But, like, I still had hopes, like, yeah, this guy could go late round one. And that combine just – I want to rephrase this. It wasn't bad. He yeah. just got outshined by better people, by yep. better D tackles that have higher potentials, I'd argue. So that's the thing about him. So moving on to a guy who um, – we've been talking about it all video about how some guys, maybe they're an edge, maybe they're a D tackle. We really don't know. They think he's a D tackle. <laughs> I think he's an edge, but, like, yeah, he can play D-tackle. Uh, Logan Hall, the D-tackle edge rusher from Houston. I mean, this guy has such a bully mentality. This guy is probably the meanest defensive tackle maybe in this entire draft. Um, I mean, he's versatile. Like I said, he has edge versatility. He has D-tackle versatility. He's a freak athlete. He, I believe, mm -hmm. didn't he run the fastest? Oh, no. He ran, I believe it was the fourth or the third fastest 40 out of all the D tackles. And he's huge. He's he said, six. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah um, find that out for me real quick. No, he's, he's like nine, 98th percentile athlete, though. Like, yeah, yeah, that's unbelievable. That unbelievable. is, I, yeah. I, knew was in the, I knew it was in the high 90s. I just didn't want to take a guess. But I mean, and the, <laughs> this guy is also huge. He's 6'6, 270, maybe 265, somewhere in between there. It's only five pound difference. So it's somewhere in between there. He's massive and he's athletic. He's strong. He's. He's like, whenever I watch him, there'll be a couple of plays where just his one punch, just one punch, and the guard is like, like just completely <laughs> falls off balance. And I'm just like, oh my God, that was one punch. One yeah. punch, and the guard's already off balance. Like, oh my goodness. What's the downside? He's not quite fully developed as a pass rusher. Good, decent run defender, I guess, but not quite fully developed as a pass rusher. But the ceiling with this guy is sky high. Like, we're talking mm -hmm. ceilings. This guy has an argument to be have one of the highest ceilings in this draft. And I don't normally make comparisons in these videos, but I just started this comparison Do before it. we started recording, and I thought it was just so perfect, and that's Eric Armstead. This guy is literally that. Eric Armstead. That. Like, really like, yeah, like I was I was messaging my friend about him, and he was like, dude, he's Eric Armstead. And I was like, oh my goodness, he is Eric Armstead. Like, more athletic Eric up. Armstead, I would also say. And Eric Armstead's been a fantastic player for the 49ers. Yeah, yeah that like, length, though. Oh, my God. Yeah, that yeah. length is perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And um, Eric Armstead hasn't been, like, a fantastic player on the 49ers. Like, he's been clearly outshined by Nick Bosa, but he's still been really, really good for them. And he switched over to the interior a lot this year. Well, not the, yeah, the interior defense aligned for the 49ers this year because Javon Kinlaw just unfortunately can't stay healthy. Hopefully he does because I love him as a prospect. But that's what Logan Hall is. He's versatile. Move them all, move them all alongside that defensive line. He has a high ceiling. If you can hit it, he will be a stud in the NFL. 
All right, so here's what you're really here for. Um, Jordan Davis to score. He's our number three defensive tackle now. He's moved up a little bit. Um, he's actually only number 37 on my board, though, uh, and I think that's that's reasonable, right? Like, he's almost a first-round pick. I actually have him even graded with a lot of people who I have in my top 32, so I wouldn't hate it if someone were to pull the trigger in the first round. Just I'd rather see it towards the end, and he's probably going to go... I think we could lock in top 20, probably top 15 at this point. Somebody's probably going to pull the trigger on him. Um, I mean, just a quick review. I, he had the best combine ever outside of Calvin Johnson, and he's 6'6", 341. Like, that is... That is the selling point. This is the best run defender you probably will ever see come out in the draft. Um, not something that we highly value. So what does he have as a pass rusher? Some insane flash plays on tape as a pass rusher. But again, the thing that concerns me is I've seen more and more people be like, oh, this guy could be a three down player um, at the next level. And if he hits his ceiling, he's going to be one of the most impact interior defensive linemen in the league you ever see. And I think in a perfect world where he plays every snap and that happens, you're probably right. Here's what I think, though. I don't think he's ever going to play every snap because I think something you also see a lot on his tape is dominant, dominant play in the first and second quarter of games and then playing less snaps in the second half. And then when he does come in the fourth quarter to play more, he's just gassed. He doesn't have it anymore. And it's, you know, you know, I don't want to like make it a weight thing, but it is quite frankly a weight thing. Like it's hard to keep up and play at high energy and be in that type of shape when you are as big as he is, even if he's in peak shape, which clearly he is. And he tested so well the combine. If you're running a four, seven, eight, 40 at 341 pounds, you can't do that more than like twice in a row. Like I guarantee you, if they had him run a third one, it would have been like a five three. Like, you only ran one like, too. You only ran <laughs> one. Yeah, it matters. One, yeah. and, you know, it, it, I think anyone who's like run and like has done track, like knows, like if you are doing an event and trying to run your fastest time, you know, yes, you can get to a point in training where you can run your fast time over and over again, but at certain point. You get tired and you can't, and your time doesn't just drop a little bit. It drops off fully. You can't match it. Your legs just don't work that way. And a guy that's 340 pounds is going to have a hard time pushing himself upfield at full speed consistently uh, for 60 minutes. It's just the way that's the it's physics. Like that's how it works. And that's why he wasn't playing every snap at Georgia. Not just because they had a bunch of players. It's because he's, he's not built to play every snap. If you draft this guy, your plan cannot be for him to play three downs. You have to have a rotation. That's why I think, Although I wouldn't take him at 12 or 14, the Ravens make sense because Baltimore is known for rotating their defensive linemen. Like they won't have this guy play all three downs. That's the spot where he could succeed. But if a team like Houston takes him, uh, Philly probably would rotate him. I think they'd be smart about it. If a team like Houston takes him, if a team like Minnesota takes him, like I don't trust that these teams won't just put him in on three downs every single play, at which point I think he becomes a liability on the field at some point. Um, so again, it's a positional value thing. It's a, how much is this guy playing thing? I know the upside is, is like tantalizing. Like people are all in for this guy and I, I, you know, I like, I like it too. I think it's awesome. I think it's cool. Like this guy's huge and he's just, he's one of the best athletes we've ever seen come out in the NFL draft in a, in, a, in years and years. We're seeing people get better and better as athletes. And this guy just blew them all out of the water yeah. at his size. Like that is yeah. unreal, but you cannot deny what he is. Like he is a run stuffing interior player. He doesn't play three downs. It's fine. Like, he's a very good football player, but the value of that in today's league, although it's maybe higher than we initially thought, isn't high enough that I'm, you know, taking this guy with a top 15 pick. Um, and that being said, it's going to happen. Um, and I, you know, I won't hate it. You know, I probably will, you know, depending on which team I, it takes him, it'll be like a C minus to B grade, depending on who takes him. Because I do think, like, fit matters. Some guys, like, I think reaching is worth, for, worth it. If you think the fit like really mm. matters For example like like i just said like i think if the ravens take him at 14 i feel much better about it than if the saints take him at 18 you know like if the saints take him at 18 uh, i don't know what's going on like i really like i'm just like <laughs> what are we doing like we're drafting more defensive linemen and we don't even rotate them as is like that's kind of been their thing is they drafted a bunch of d linemen and they don't rotate them well so you know it, it, it'll be fascinating to see what ends up happening here I, I think we're getting a little bit away from what has succeeded at the NFL level, and we're getting fascinated by kind of these, you know, cosmetic things, quite frankly. And and that's just the way the NFL is. Like we are, you know, we left. We like the wow. We like this. This the, the uh, what's it called? We use this in a. It's a word we use in journalism a lot. We love the. Uh, it's like when you oh, like make some, We love the sensationalism of sports. Like it's it's a yeah. big thing, you know. Um, and J Jordan Davis is 
the most sensationalized prospect I've ever seen, and it's great. He's going to sell jerseys to whoever takes him. That's also going to put him up the draft board. But <laughs> I think in terms of on the football field, I, I, I don't see the top 15. I see, you know, late first round probably. Yeah. And also something you didn't mention, and it connects to what you said, teams are going to expose the fact that he cannot play that many downs in a row. Alabama did it, and he was useless. He was absolutely useless yeah. after that first quarter. He was good. Listen, like, I had a friend message me because the first play of the game, he had a great tackle, and he was like, oh, look at Jordan Davis. And I'm like, watch. You know what they're going to do? They're going to run hurry up offense. They're going to gas him out, and he will be flat out useless. And that's what they did. And Alabama took that over and dominated that Georgia defense. Bryce Young took that defense and ripped them to shreds. And that is what NFL teams are going to figure out with Jordan Davis. That is why, like, for everybody watching on TikTok, that's why I've always been so low on him. Because, yes, the ceiling is there. The ceiling is there. Listen, he may, he's never going to be like someone like Aaron Donald or someone like an all-time great. But he has the ceiling, possibly, of being one of the best D-tackers of all time behind probably Aaron Donald. But the issue is there's so many questions. There's so many questions. Can he have the ability to continually play plays without getting gassed? Because he hasn't proved it at all. He hasn't proved it at all. And, yes, he tested as one of the greatest athletes we've ever seen. There's no denying that. The guy who does RAS said Jordan Davis has the second highest grade he's ever given a prospect. And he's been doing this since 1986. And you know who's number one? Calvin Johnson. Calvin Johnson. Dude. Calvin that Johnson is, is the only company. person since 1986 to test as a better athlete than Jordan Davis. And you're probably thinking, of course he has to be a top 10 pick. But there's so many questions. Yeah. There's and so think, many questions. I think a huge thing that you're seeing is that no one has a comp for this guy. Because there isn't, right? There like, isn't and a comp I think for this guy. No. When there isn't a comp for this guy, like, it means one of two things either like this is truly something we've never seen before and it's going to be special or it hasn't worked and there's a reason why it hasn't worked um my comp i think is actually very easy although i wouldn't compare these guys as off field uh i i think i actually don't like that comp i think um in terms of off fields i think they're not the same person because i think this other guy was very lazy um and it's what ruined him eventually Uh, i think he's albert hainsworth i do like (laughs) And Albert Hainsworth, yeah. let, let, let me just say, because everyone's going to laugh at that because everyone thinks about the contract and everything. Albert Hainsworth, before that contract, Amazing. was one of the best players in the NFL. Yeah. He yeah. was dominant, but he was Albert also Haynes- a rotational, oh run-stuffing first defensive lineman. And also at a time where running the ball was more prevalent. Sean Alexander won an MVP once upon a time in an offense that ran two fullbacks. Like, in 2006, it wasn't that long ago. Like, and that's what Albert Hainsworth is going up against. And Jordan Davis isn't playing in that league anymore. So he's got to learn to be a pass rusher. Yeah. I think his, I think his character off field, I don't think he'll ever quit on football the way Albert no. Hainsworth will, did. And that is going to give him, you know, more of a chance than Hainsworth ever had in the, on a second contract. I guarantee you that. I think for what it's worth, even if Davis isn't a great player, he was going to get a second contract because he's a great person and teams are going to want to have him in his, in their building, you know? Um, but I think what you're looking for is that type of player at this point. That's who he is. Yeah. Yes, I, what what I would say, true. what I to defend Jordan Davis a little bit is that he played at 365 pounds at Georgia. He came into the combine at 340. Like so, Dude. maybe, but maybe that could, that could be a double-edged sword. No, I don't know if that will be because I honestly think like he's going to have maybe a better motor now because he won't get gas. Still a lot, yeah. <laughs> it is still a lot. Trust me, but he tested as a, a hundred percentile athlete. But again, like the motor, but he also doesn't look like like he looks fit. Like, yeah, you know, like, you know? yeah. So maybe now you, you draw, like, listen, the three forty is still huge, but like dropping twenty five pounds should make a pretty decent difference you guys mentioned he's just not he's nothing he as speaks to his work he's, ethic too. he's just nothing as a pass rusher he adds i think he has eight total pressures in his entire career he had no no he had i i because i memorized it because it's so absurd in four years at georgia four years he had 25 pressures in four years yeah it just he's nothing four years. he had nine in 15 games hutchinson had 15 in one 
Yeah, it's yeah. It, look, he's just nothing. Georgia beat Michigan. What I what another Georgia what, beat it, Michigan. Yeah, true. What I will say, and he's also the Benark Award winner, so he's better than Aiden Hutchinson. And yeah, the Jordan, Trophy Jordan winner, Davis yeah. is the reason so they beat Michigan, and Hutchinson than, is the reason they lost. He's better than a Cam Aquanu. He's won the Outland Trophy too. He's the best defense player in college football, even though Aiden Hutchinson came in second for the freaking Heisman Trophy. Uh, but anyway, and what I will say is something that I've actually come around on a little bit because I think some people uh, who have explained, explained it pretty well, and I'm like, you know what, I, I kind of get that, is Jordan Davis for for a team like the Chargers until they got Sebastian Joseph Day, like Jordan Davis is a run defense into himself. You know, it's almost like, okay, we have that guy and, and pretty much good up the middle in the run game. He is that good as a run defender, but yeah, just in Drop today's in coverage. Yeah, exactly. Like, Jordan Davis is your run defense. There it is. Which I think, again, run running the ball is not as prevalent as Nick uh, put, but it is like when you can have one guy and be like, all right, we're just we're good up the middle. We don't have to worry about it. That's valuable, and, and he's probably going to be a first-round pick because of it. And I won't hate it as much just because of the athleticism um, and the and the run defense tape, but as a pass rusher, he's he's nothing. He literally is nothing. Like He doesn't he's add anything. He's nothing at all. He's nothing. He's nothing at all. all he, right. does, he, he does show very few flashes, but – and he uh, lost yeah, that, weight, though, so he, we'll see. He did lose weight, and that's why I did say he has yet to prove it. Like, mm-hmm. I said for a reason, like, I, I did say for a reason that, like, yes, he gets gas, and I said, yes, he lost weight, but he hasn't proved that he will do it. Obviously, he hasn't had a chance, so that's not really his fault exactly. But once he gets in the NFL, we will see what Jordan Davis is like. And if all my questions do come true, I mean, yeah, I don't know, yeah. I don't know what to say. He, uh, I love that Albert Hainsworth comp, Nick, because he had a play against Alabama that was kind of like the Haynes. It's not as bad as the Hainsworth thing. He was laying down on the field while Michael Vick was running around. No, I it posted like, it on the TikTok. Like, yeah, like, yeah, he's just like, he's ahead. just holding the guy. He's just he's like just, holding his shoulder pads. And that's all he's doing. He's not even like moving. He's just like, because he's gassed. Tired. They're running hurry yeah. up. You know, but whatever. Oh, look, yeah, we're not com- we're not saying he's gonna be that bad and steal yeah, money. Actually, no, maybe like, I shouldn't have made like, that comp because like, we're gonna get flame now. But well, real quick, but real I like quick, it. I we like we it. have we it. have been yeah. crapping on this guy a little bit, but we all accept the fact this guy's ceiling is a first bound Hall of Famer. That is his <laughs> ceiling. It really is. Like yeah. he can be that type of player, but there's just so many question marks. And yeah, like yeah, he's gonna go first round, and I'm not gonna hate it. But I just don't agree with the whole top fifteen thing. I just think it's ridiculous with just all the as questions. As a pass rusher, I don't. He, you have to be a great pass rusher, I think, in today's NFL. And you just, yeah. he's not. He's literally nothing. So I don't know. I, I don't get it either. But yeah, I like him enough now, especially after the combine, because that was historic stuff. It was historic. It was a historical combine. Um, moving on to our next e tackle, we took a long time with Jordan Davis, but actually we just hyped it up. We hyped we, it up. We had we hyped it up, and we had we had we just had we, to we just spent one we show thoughts. On yeah. <laughs> we spent 13 minutes. Oh my gosh, that's ridiculous. That might be a record. Um, that's definitely a record. Yeah, oh, that's right, absolutely though. a record. That's absolutely a record. All right, so up next on our list, uh, Travis Jones from UConn. Um, I kind of view this guy as the baby version of Jordan Davis, except not as many questions, I would say. Um, I think he's a run stuffing D tackle who has a lot of questions that pass rushing, but I do think he's a better pass rusher than Jordan Davis, but. Once again, that is not saying much. I don't think Travis Jones is that great of a pass rusher and also much worse competition, which matters. But then you could also say Jordan Davis was surrounded by a legendary group of front seven for him. I mean, no, Kobe Dean, Trayvon Walker, Adam Anderson. Yes, he, he got into some legal trouble, but when he was on the field, he was really good. He's, he's in this draft, too, by the way. I oh, don't he know is? He yeah, he's in this I thought draft. He's in, I thought he was arrested. No, he's, uh, he's not in jail, but he's he's in the draft. And we're not going to talk about him because he. Yeah, let's a, not let's not let's not talk about him. But no, like just care to evaluate. Yeah, yeah I don't. We're, want we're to, not I don't want to touch that guy. I'm not touching no, that. Guy. Yeah, but. we're not we're not we don't have to talk about him. But he was on that defensive line and he was good when he played. But that's just another example of how much talent was around Jordan Davis and there's none around Travis Jones. I mean, we're talking about UConn yeah, football for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah like. They they had a three year gap of not winning a single football game like that's the, we're talking about UConn football like let's be real, so I do like Travis Jones though. Tested is a very very good athlete. Like I've been saying for the whole video, those top four guys that I've mentioned, they all tested insanely athletically, and he was in that conversation with them. Um, even though he's higher on this list than Jordan Davis, uh, Jordan Davis's ceiling is much much higher. The problem is is he just doesn't have nearly as many questions as Jordan Davis. He doesn't get gassed. He's not as big, so maybe he's not as good at his job as Jordan Davis. But the gas thing is a legit thing for Davis, and I have no questions about that with Travis Jones because he's shown he can play as a three-down 
defensive tackle in college. And yeah, it could change in the NFL, but I still think he'll be fine in the NFL. So at the end of the day, he's just baby Jordan Davis with less question marks, but definitely a lowest ceiling, 100%. I like it. I actually like his pass rushing a little. I think he's more of like a pocket pusher. He's not like a, you know, amazing man. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's easier what you want in a nose tackle, I think. Um, all right, our number one guy, I actually uh, did a TikTok on this guy today, and I have him as a top 20 player now in the draft, is Devontae Wyatt, the better defensive tackle at Georgia. Um, and that is because Devontae Wyatt, unlike Jordan Davis, was a terrific pass rusher this year. I was so, so impressed with Devontae Wyatt's tape as a pass rusher. And really it's because this guy, Donnie, you mentioned how the top four guys are freak athletes. Yeah, Devontae Wyatt. I mean, like, it, it was – unfair i would say to logan hall and Devonte wide and travis jones it, it was unfair what jordan davis did to them <laughs> at the combine because jordan davis like yeah. we mentioned before was the greatest athlete besides calvin johnson to ever step foot in the combine but Devonte wide and those other three guys like they put on some shows like we would be talking like holy crap you won't believe what Devonte wyatt did he was phenomenal 96 percentile athlete um he ran like a 4-8 but it was just jordan davis who is 40 pounds heavier, ran a 4.75, basically. It was like, holy crap, man. But Devontae White is get-off is fantastic. He's such an athletic player. He actually has really, really good bend, I think, for the position, too. Um, I was so – his hand usage, I think, is pretty good. But the issues with Devontae White, and he's kind of like the anti-Jordan Davis in a lot of ways in that he's still a really good run defender because of his get-off, and he just blows up plays immediately. But if you double-team Devontae White, he doesn't quite have the strength that Jordan Davis was, where Jordan Davis will eat up double-teams. And that honestly made him very valuable in the Georgia defense because you have N'Kobe Dean or Channing Tindall or whatever, Quay Walker, blitz up the middle. Jordan Davis is eating up two blocks, man. Wyatt and, next to him, I mean. That defense yeah, is ridiculous, and Wyatt, dude. Yeah, that and Jalen Carter. Ridiculous. Jalen Carter with him, too. And apparently the oh number two pick, Trayvon Walker. It was ridiculous. Yeah, they had an all-time defense. But, yeah, and – that what makes him so valuable is it eats up double teams. Devontae White won't quite do that. He doesn't have the strength to do that. Um, he's not really a powerful player yet, but otherwise he's a freak athlete. The best get off. I think of any D tackle in this draft. He's such an athletic player and he was an ama- he's a really good pass rusher and a really good run defender, such a balanced player overall. Another question I had with him is he's a fifth year senior and this was kind of the first year that Devontae White was really this good. Like he was a decent player before and then he really exploded this year. So now you can say to yourself, is this because he's older than everyone else in the field or did something finally click for Devontae White? Which I think is a question, especially at a D tackle position where we're like being more physical and, and more physically dominant is such an important part of that position. When you're older than a lot of the guys on the field, like that matters. So Maybe that'll play a factor in the NFL. Uh, my comparison for him, Nick, I don't know if you saw this too, is Deron Payne. I compared him to the Washington D tackle, like who just that. was a, another freak athlete, like underratedly freak athlete. And um, he had an amazing year at Alabama his last year, and he wasn't great that before that, but he ended up being a top 15 pick in the draft because of it. And he's been like a solid D tackle for the commanders. Like, I don't know if Devontae White is a you know superstar defensive tackle. I don't know if any of these guys are, to be honest. But I think he'll be a really, really solid player in the NFL because of his versatility as a run defender, as a pass rusher, and how explosive an athlete he is. So Devontae Wyatt, to me, is the best D-tackle in this draft. Real quick, like just to break down this defensive tackle, just real quick. Like I have one first-round grade on a D-tackle, and it's Devontae Wyatt. I have four or five second-round grades on these guys. I have a second-round grade on so many of these guys on this list. So, yeah, it's not top-heavy. Like I've been saying, like I said in one of our previous videos, like this draft isn't superstar heavy, but it's super, super depth. I would, I'd would, i argue this draft has super more depth, depth than depth. last year's. Yeah, you have I quality argue- starters. I don't know if there's no superstar. Like I would take Bar. I don't know about you guys. I would probably take Barmore over right? any one of these guys. Yeah, yeah just because the Wyatt, then. Barmore was my Wyatt comp. I have him a little lower. I think Barmore is maybe a slightly like more developed pass rusher. Um, yeah. Which is like a big deal, I think. But I think why well, I do think Wyatt actually could have that impact. I believe I think that Wyatt Barmore had for the Patriots here one. I think he has yeah. that ability in him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's there's not you know we don't have a Quinn Quill- Williams. We might have it next year though in another Georgia D tackle Jalen Carter. So he is phenomenal. He is. So he is. Good. I I am excited for 2023 talk because there are some guys that I'm already and, falling in love. And be excited for next week's video because next week's video will be a blast. That edges. Edges, edges, yeah, edges, right. yeah. 
Oh boy. Uh, we're gonna weird. we're gonna have to take an hour to like argue it and then an hour to do the video probably. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be <laughs> fun. But yeah. All right, that's what we got on our top ten defensive tackles in this draft. Of course, follow our Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Boomer Bus Draft. Like and subscribe, rate us five stars, leave a review, leave some questions in there as well. Check out the merch store. Um, and that's what we got. And make sure you guys check out Winview as well, because they are the best. So Nick Miriam and Don Donnie Clemens, I'm Max Shadwick. Have a great night.